All right, guys. So voice came out okay. So we're gonna head. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and, and get lecture going. Uh, if you saw on the Moodle uh, page for our uh, session uh, for this week, you note that the uh, test 2A is coming up. That's not uh, due until Wednesday uh, midnight, we'll say, the end of the day, Wednesday. Just make sure we get it done. It's actually available to you right now, uh, but I wouldn't get on it until you've heard these, this lecture and, and, uh, and then Wednesday's lecture prior. But, I mean, if you feel like it, you want to get to it, uh, you can try it. It's open. There's no password. It's not password protected. Uh, it does go over the three branches and uh, what we talked about, so Articles 1, 2, and 3. Uh, we haven't gotten to 3 yet. We're going to get on that when we talk about the courts today. We've intermingled the courts, actually all branches in, uh, as we've uh, talked about the process and, uh, and really started to address how the courts fit in in terms of evaluation in the policy process last week. So we're going to kind of continue on with that, talk about uh, – Again, that, that role of the courts, um, some of the things that we, we hit on that you'll see on this test, um, Article 1, Section 8 in the Constitution enumerates, in other words, what's written, enumerated, what's written in the Constitution enumerates the powers uh, in that contract between the states and this national government and empowering this national government, which was weak under the Articles of Confederation. The Constitution was meant to give that uh, the central government authority, but only in those areas delegated or listed within the Constitution, hence the Tenth Amendment, which, again, that language was not in the original Constitution, right, that only those things that were, um, you know, provided to the national government for them to do would, would be it. That's it. Those are the things they can do. Anything outside of that would be left to the states to decide. And, uh, and if we want to change the contract, there's a process for that. That's Article 5. Um, which we're, we're getting into, um, you know, starting next week as we as we move along into the Constitution. Uh, but but the addition of that Tenth Amendment comes as a condition for ratification, right? Not only the rights of individuals um, and states uh, to be protected from the national government interfering in things like religion or speech or um, you know due, due process rights, the takings clause, uh, all of those things are added in as protections to the individuals from this national government and its authority. Remember, it's given the power in Article 1, Section 8 to tax and given the power, uh, power in Article 1, Section 8 to raise and keep military, right, armies. So you've got the, 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 the means to take uh, somebody's resources, right, somebody's, uh, somebody's uh, uh, farm through taxation or some other uh, thing of value through taxation, and then the force to be able to do that with having the military behind that. And that, of course, needed to be tempered by the states. You had the states that were concerned, certainly, of just getting out of an American Revolution where you had that unitary system of government, right, king, parliament, dictating to the colonies, uh, much to the chagrin of the colonists and their belief that they were getting the short end. And, uh, and they weren't necessarily interested in going back to that type of of a, a system of unitary government. So a system of carefully shared powers, all right, a federal system comes via, the, via that uh, enumeration, or excuse me, the uh, ratification of the Constitution, enumerating those powers that the federal government would have, capping that with the Ninth and Tenth Amendment, which would ensure that the states would retain those powers not freely given to the national government in this ratification process. And that if the national government needed or wanted some uh, some greater power to make the system work, then there would be a negotiation. Not unlike, again, contract law. If we think about it as a contract between two parties, this makes sense. Um, if you were to hire somebody to do something and you establish a contract, right, they do it and you return for their services a monetary amount or some other service uh, in kind, then, uh, then you would negotiate that out. And, uh, and uh, you know, standard business operations. And that, if we think about the Constitution in that, um, in that vein, then we have a good understanding of why certain things were enumerated, what was left off, why the party that was creating this national government, or at least empowering this national government, was going to be very jealous of its powers in terms of what it gave up. And again, if we think about that relationship of hiring somebody to do something, Right. We, we expect them to do those things we ask them to do. and We will pay them for those things. Uh, we're not giving them or empowering them to do more um, there. We're not empowering them to, to, to take more, expect more from what it is that we hire them to do. So, again, it's a very careful contract. The Constitution is a very careful, careful um, um, negotiation um, in, in terms of what the states ultimately want 
and what they'll accept and what the national government and those who are nationalists or federalists want in this system to have a more perfect union. I think, again, the main objective of the Federalists was thinking in, in the context of unionizing, right, a union, unionizing the states to be a more powerful voice in dealing with foreign countries, um, in dealing with, uh, with trade within the United States, um, um, you know, as the expansion was to take place uh, throughout North America, right, there's still unconquered territory, if you will, in North America, and, and so um, um, being of, of, of one entity for that expansion would certainly make that expansion process easier. So I, those are the things that are in mind as we're, we're thinking about the, the Federalists, um, um, you know, motives. And at the same time, you had the state motives and those are the anti-Federalists who didn't want to spin into a system where there wasn't control over the government. And, uh, and keeping it closer to the people, local government, ensures that the people can control their government, right? And so uh, those are the two uh, in interacting motives that lead to the Constitution. And then what comes from that is the enumeration in this constitution of the powers that this national government was going to have. Those are found primarily in Article 1, Section 8. So it goes through and it lists all of those things that, uh, that the federal government would be able to do. Again, the Bill of Rights is a condition for ratification for the states, right? It doesn't even get to the nine of the 13, let alone all 13 states, without those protections. Again, capping it with the Ninth and Tenth Amendment, which is a, a catch-all, and it says if it's not in the Constitution, it'll be for the states to decide. And that was a specific um, counter to what was in the Constitution as first proposed called the enumer or the elastic clause or the necessary and proper clause. At the end of Article 1, Section 8, there's a, there's a catch-all phrase that says, and to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and those powers of the, con you know, the Constitution given to the federal government. Um, who's to determine what those powers were? What are, what are we talking about in terms of that open-ended kind of language that, you know, um, it, whatever is necessary and proper for, for carrying into execution these foregoing powers? What are those foregoing powers? Taxation, the economy, commerce? Uh, what, are those, what are those powers in the Constitution? General welfare? What are those powers? And so, again, that was unacceptable language. It was too vague, too broad for the states in their ratification process, hence the Ninth and Tenth Amendment. The Ninth and Tenth Amendment come to amend that enumeration of, of basically whatever's necessary, uh, we can do it as long as it's within these these powers you've given us. Yeah, but those powers are, are fairly broad if uh, if you think about it, right? To regulate the value of money, that's where we get into McCulloch versus Maryland. And that McCulloch versus Maryland case is where Marshall establishes a precedent, right? Interpretation of the Constitution through judicial review, Harvard versus Madison, judicial review, where Marshall uh, in the Marshall Court, established the, the, the precedent uh, of incorporating the Necessary and Proper Clause back into the Constitution, really um, uh, making, for all intents and purposes, depending on the court, the Ninth and Tenth Amendment moot. In other words, not having an impact, right? They're, 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 they're moot, uh, M-O-O-T. Uh, uh, so the, they are they are moot, moot in terms of their their effect. If um, the court can point to something in the Constitution that that makes this whatever act of Congress or whatever interpretation a part of what is necessary and proper for carrying into execution some power within the Constitution. And again, when we think in, in broad terms, what does it mean that the federal government um, is to provide the general welfare? Uh, what does that mean? Well, if we interpret that to mean general welfare as in uh, feeding, clothing, housing, uh, providing jobs, providing education, uh, we can get really broad then in what Congress has the authority to do to meet that uh, objective of providing general welfare. Um, and, and again, that kind of broad language was ultimately rejected by the states, and then the Ninth and Tenth Amendments were meant to temper that. Um, Later on, there'll be the, the, the courts and, and uh, you know, judicial scholars who like to look past that will point to the fact that it doesn't say specifically delegated. Well, that's the language the states wanted. I mean, in the ratification clauses, they wanted that specificity of what is being given up by the states and assumed by this new national government that's being empowered by the states as to what they can and can't do. They want that to be 
to their favor, ultimately, that if it's something outside of what we believe to be correct, it comes back to the states. Um, it's the national government, right, that ultimately proposes the, the Bill of Rights that then go to the states for ratification. So it's kind of the, to a degree, it's the fox guarding the hen house in, in writing those amendments that then go back to the states for the states to ratify, depending on the core group of individuals uh, uh, in the national government who are, who are crafting and writing. Uh, but clearly, through the ratification clauses, right, we go to the Yale Avalon Project, take a look at those 18th century documents, so those in the 1700s, look at those ratifications of the Constitution in each of the states. If you go into the latter states, you'll see that they have concerns and, and truly want the language that is being afforded to this national government to be narrow. And, uh, and that, that fight of the Federalists wanting to expand the powers of the national government to dictate to the states, to move the states together in unison for those things that made sense, whether it was uh, protecting the borders, dealing in trade, or expanding our own borders. Um, they wanted to have that, that power without having to go back to the states. And ultimately, um, every time that there was some, some challenge to the power of the national government, deferring back to the states for the states to say, yeah, you can do this or can't through a constitutional process. And, and that's understood. That makes sense. Um, uh, at the same time, it totally makes sense for the states to say, but we're not going to give up our authority carte blanche. And really that McCulloch versus Maryland case, which we talked about, which was over banking and the regulating the value of money, certainly opens that Pandora's box for, for not just the Marshall Court, but for future courts to look back and say, well, this is within the purview of the federal government because of the precedent Marbury versus Ma or, uh, uh, McCulloch versus uh, Maryland, but also because of... Uh, um, uh, because of the, the language that's enumerated in the Constitution that is the Necessary and Proper Clause. What the Necessary and Proper Clause does is it takes this idea of it has to be written in the Constitution, has to be enumerated, to where it can be implied in the Constitution. So, so the Necessary and Proper Clause, right, precedent, McCulloch versus Maryland, gives us this idea that the Constitution contains implied powers and that ultimately the court and Congress will interpret what is implied by the Constitution, much again to the chagrin of the states. That, as much as anything, in that interpretation of what is implied by commerce and uh, what is implied by general welfare has certainly allowed for the national government to expand. I mean, the whole New Deal, um, uh, the whole New Deal of FDR, the New Deal legislation is really predicated on the national government, the federal government being able to do much more than it was ever intended to do. Uh, and then ultimately the court, as we talked about, I think in their, their last class or the class prior, the court eventually agreeing with that interpretation of what the federal government could or couldn't do. And again, you know, once, once the federal government is given the go ahead, who's to stop it? And that's kind of the civil war, right? How do you stop the national government from doing those things that you as a state don't believe they were empowered to do? That's the civil war. So, so once there's some legitimacy or, or particularly from the courts, you create a, a constitutional conundrum if the states don't adhere to that court's interpretation of the contract of the constitution. So it really empowers the courts with the ability, not only through interpretation, Marbury versus Madison judicial review, but this idea of the enumerated or implied powers of the national government to, for the courts to actually really expand the relationship, um, the, the powers of the national government, and to, and to really change the relationship uh, between the states and, and the federal government as to who's in charge. Again, the Civil War helps to do that. But even after the Civil War, there's still an adherence to the amendment process. Um, um, the 13th Amendment follows much more closely the constitutional process uh, correctly than the 14th and the 15th Amendments do. The 15th and the, and the 14th and the 15th Amendments, the Reconstruction Amendments, those two specifically, less the 13th Amendment, but those two specifically, the 14th and the 15th, are really shady in terms of how they're ultimately passed. I mean, kudos to those individuals who wanted to empower the national government more, particularly after the Civil War, and to ensure an end to slavery, but also using that opportunity to expand the political base of the Republican Party by ultimately offering uh, uh, 
uh, voting rights, right, to, to all men, regardless of the color of their skin, and certainly um, taking advantage, if you will, of the opportunity to really expand the ranks of voters who are going to be beholden to the Republican Party. I mean, it's a fledgling party. The Republican Party gets started uh, leading up to the Civil War and, uh, and then gets a, get, gains a foothold and then certainly becomes one of the, well, it's, as it is today, it's one of the two major parties today. And, uh, and so there's the opportunity to expand the voting, which then, of course, leads to, uh, as it's a numbers game, more of the Republican Party in uh, the legislature uh, and in state legislatures to then begin to dictate policy and then take the country in the direction um, that their platform would lead to. Uh, hopefully one more, which is, uh, again, based more on freedom, at least today, uh, than equity. Uh, in terms of the balance, but at the same time, uh, not devoid of either. Uh, same is true with the Democrats, not devoid of freedom, just a little bit of a, um, a grander um, uh, flavor, if you will, or emphasis upon the idea of equality and equity. So, but if we go back and we take a look at the 14th and 15th Amendments in their passage, pretty shady, pretty sketchy. And, uh, and we can talk about that in greater detail uh, after this uh, test. But the, the, the 14th and 15th Amendments uh, certainly set up for, through interpretation of the courts, again, even a broader and stronger role for the national government uh, in deference to the interests of the states moving forward. Um, okay, so if we go back to our, our policy process, make sure we kind of have this in mind. I know we've already been tested over this once, but those five steps to the policy process, build, formulate, adopt, right? Implement and evaluate. And again, if we do it by articles, Article 3, Article 2, and this is Article 1. All right. And if we build, formulate, adopt, implement, and evaluate, this is the idea of identification of a problem, right? Getting to understand that there's a problem that needs to be fixed. Then the formulation, once we agree there's a problem that needs to fix, is brainstorming that solution. And there's a lot of parts to that. All right. And then once we brainstormed the solution, we've gotten to know the problem, we've defined it, we've come up with a solution, we've looked at it from uh, you know, six ways from Sunday, we've, we've debated, we've looked at the price, we've looked at the timing, we've looked at the, the political fallout uh, in this process of formulation, then it's time to choose that best solution. And again, when we say best, well, it's, it's relative, right? So if the Republicans are in control of the legislative process, in other words, they'll ultimately identify what the problems are and then what the best solution is. And if you're a Democrat, you may not either agree there's a problem or you may not agree that this is, a, this is the best solution if you're not controlling the process, the legislative process. And, this, and the, flip, the flip, is, uh, flip side is true if you're, again, if you're a, a Republican as a minority in a Democrat-controlled uh, legislature. Right now, the House of Representatives is controlled by the Democrats, so they're ultimately determining what the problems are and what the solutions are. And, and uh, conversely, the, in the U.S. government, uh, our U.S. Senate is controlled by the Republicans, and so they have a different understanding or idea of maybe what the problems are or even certainly what the solutions are. And I think when it comes to COVID relief, you're seeing a, a great example, a prime example of 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 where both parties, right, both sides, the Republicans and Democrats, see the, the problem with needing to uh, boost up the economy and keep it going through this COVID threat. But they certainly have a difference of, of understanding of what the best solution is. Um, how much is to go out? Where are we going to target that? How do we keep the economy going? There's a difference of opinion right now. And both of those chambers, the House and the Senate, have to come together on something Right, some some common solution to this problem before there's adoption. Right, it's not the House passes to the Senate, the Senate ultimately decides, or vice versa. It's the House and the Senate come together on the solution that's been passed out for implementation. Right, to carry out carry out this solution, and this is where. The president comes in, the executive, the chief executive overseeing the bureaucracy where that solution is carried out, right, from that top down through the middle management to that street level bureaucrat, the individual who ultimately will, 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 will get the dollars to where they need to go, will check on those dollars to make sure that uh, um, 
you know, whatever's passed through the legislature, through Congress, once their job is done, is actually seen and, and carried out, executed. Again, we have some checks and balances here that are listed, right? The veto power of the president, which is really saying, I'm not going to implement this because that's the main function of the president, the, the executive, whether it's the governor or the president, their main function is to implement. And that veto is to say, I'm not, I'm not going to implement this. We don't, I don't think this is in the best interest of the whole. I represent the whole. You represent states or, or districts within states. I represent the whole of the country. And I don't necessarily believe this is the right way to go. And, uh, and that would be the veto. And, and typically, right, when it comes to the veto, when they send it back or the president sends it back to the legislature, he'll tell them or she'll tell them, this is not, this is why this is not a good idea. Um, in the state of Michigan, for example, the legislature um, uh, passed legislation onto the governor regarding um, um, making it a felony if an individual uh, knowingly fills out two applications for four ballots or two ballots uh, in this upcoming presidential election. Um, well, at any time, really, is how the language would read. And the governor vetoed it. And the governor gave a reason that she, she vetoed it. She said, those are already, that's already against the law. And, uh, and we don't want this to create more confusion. Whether you agree with that veto message or not, she offered rationale as to why she's vetoing it. I don't know what you do with that. Sometimes the, the, the president will come back or the governor will come back and give guidance and say, I can't support it the way it's written. However, if it was written this way, I could, I could sign that. And then that then allows the legislature to change if, it's, if they perceive it to be in the you know, part of the best solution to change their solution or not. They could attempt to simply override the veto, which takes two thirds, both at the state level and the federal level, two thirds of both the House and the Senate to override that veto. Not easy to do. It's not supposed to be easy to do, right? This is the checks and balances. However, if the, in, all right, so in terms of implementation, if the chief executive actually signs it or if it's overridden, it becomes law. And as law, the expectation is going to be carried out and carried out, not just now and today and under this administration, but for all subsequent in, uh, administrations that come in after. The law is the law until it's changed, right? Or, right, altered this way. When it comes to evaluation, we have courts and the courts can come in in their evaluation process and they can judge the law and interpret whether it's constitutional or not. Or, as we talked about in last class, make sure that what is being, right, what was asked for, what the solution was that was passed by the lawmakers is actually what is being carried out by the implementers, right? The bureaucracy, the executive branch, are they carrying out the law as intended? And that's where, again, the court comes in to evaluate, especially if there's a question of intent, right? The executive comes in and has a, a different understanding of, or, right, whether it's political or it's, it's, uh, truly not. It's uh, it's benign, but their interpretation is one that doesn't match what the legislature believes is the proper interpretation or some business that's being impacted by how the bureaucracy is carrying out uh, this law or some individual who disagrees with how the bureaucracy is carrying out the law. This is where there may be a controversy between what was intended and what's actually being implemented. And again, that's where the courts come in. Now, this is where Back our, uh, to our courts, back to the very beginning days of class, back to your text. This is where originalism, right? This is where originalism, where activism, where judicial restraint, uh, textualism, or strict constructionism, It's where all these terms come back to play. They're all really dealing with how the court approaches this process of interpretation. So when the court is asked, triggered, right? When some party asks them to evaluate, the court can take a number of different um, um, avenues towards uh, coming up with their conclusion, right? They can either say, okay, what was the original intent of the law writers? If we go back to that judicial philosophy or that, that philosophy, just philosophy in general, 
the idea that when it comes to the written word, there's one way and one way only to correctly interpret the written word. And that is as the author intended, then the role of the originalist or the duty of the originalist is to get as close if they can, as they can to understanding why, uh, what the context, the content of the, uh, of the, of the law, what was going on at the time, uh, what supporting documentation is there that gives us insight as to what the intent of the uh, author uh, was. And that that's the, not just the purest way of properly interpreting the intention of our legislative branch or the lawmaker, uh, it's also the proper way when it comes to originalism. Now, activism would take us in a bit of a different direction. Activism would say, we understand that this is the interpretation. We don't agree necessarily with that interpretation, or we don't think that the effect of what that law is having uh, was intended. And, and because the uh, law is not having the intended effect, we're going to choose uh, we're going to choose to to reinterpret that law to get it to having that intended effect, right? So so we per perceive in, in our interpretation, right? This is where originalism comes in. We perceive that even though this is settled, even though uh, the the uh, law does X, right? We truly don't believe in the in the hierarchy of of, of all things government that that the framers, the lawmakers, the writers could have intended for this to be the outcome. If it doesn't end in equity, if it doesn't end in equality or an equal application of the law, 14th Amendment, then it cannot possibly be the intent of the, the authors. And therefore, we're going to change how we've applied or even how the law or what the law was written to do to make sure that we get this outcome that fits within the 14th Amendment, that fits within our interpretation of the Constitution, which is the overarching law of the land. So, as we said very at the very beginning of class, all judges, all justices, right, will, will claim the mantle of originalism. They'll all argue the mantle of originalism because, again, to, to not... Is to, is, to, is to ultimately say, I'm going to decide. And we know, right, at our, at, our, at, our, at our heart's level, we know that that's not the role of the courts. It's not for them to simply make it up as they go along. They have to attach their interpretation to something, either the Constitution as they understand it, preferably the Constitution as they understand it, or within some, some power that the Constitution is lax on, but Congress has stepped up, the elected body has stepped up and said, this is a policy we want to put in place, right? So some government entity has stepped up to fit in if the Constitution is mum on that, right? Go back to the elastic clause, necessary and proper clause. Go back to this idea that the, the, the federal government enumerates powers to the, to the federal government or the federal Constitution enumerates powers to the federal government. It's typically mum except for a few uh, things that it outlaws states from doing, like state-to-state -state compacts and and um, um, printing their own currency, things like that. Uh, then, then, right, the the, the uh, uh, justices, the judges, uh, may simply defer to the elected bodies or the state constitutions or the local charters or even common law to help direct and determine whether or not the actions between uh, individuals are okay or not okay. Right. Terms like restraint, um, they, and even strict constructionism, but restraint, they, they don't necessarily meet the true definition of originalism. Um, we would consider this to be conservative or more conservative than this, um, judicial restraint, because it basically says we're going to adhere to the interpretations that are in place, whereas true originalism, um, unlike um, um, has, as has been um, portrayed by uh, Amy Coney Barrett in her interpretation of Scalia's originalism, and we think of Scalia as kind of the, um, the uber originalist, um, his originalism was still tempered by restraint in that, um, according to Amy Coney Barrett, who, who clerked 
for Scalia. So she was she, she, she was an apprentice under Scalia, if you think of clerks as apprentices. And, uh, and in her interpretation of Scalia's, um, um, how he came about um, uh, questions before the court and, and this idea of originalism, he, he would adhere to what we would call stare decisis. He would adhere to stare decisis um, um, if it was settled, but if it was a new question, that's when he would be more likely to apply originalism. And he took it case by case. He wasn't a purist uh, in that, and, and some would find fault in that. You know, you, you're, if you're originalist, you should be originalist all the time. Um, but there were some areas where, again, he went back and said, look, I don't agree with the original decision, but that's the decision that was made. That's the decision we've been applying now. Um, that's, that's how individuals understand the law. And so the restraint would be to not upset uh, what everybody or how everybody is interpreting uh, this current function of government, you know, Congress, the Constitution, or, or or some role of an individual therein. So that would be what we call judicial restraint, not upsetting the apple cart, not creating new precedent. Uh, again, if it's a new question and you're going to practice restraint, then you'd go back to the Constitution and say, what was the intent, the interpretation, right? But if it's already been interpreted, then you'd follow Stare decisis, allowing the past decisions to stand. Stare decisis, stairs of decisions. You stand on one stair and then the next and then the next. And so think of it as a stair of decisions that each time Congress or, or the courts, I should say, interpret uh, and make an interpretation, that then becomes the precedent. That then becomes the interpretation. And uh, the restraint says, let's not make new interpretations. Right? An activist may say, look, the old interpretations were wrong. Right? We're going to go outside of, of, of what this interpretation has been because the outcome is not necessarily what we agree with as being constitutional. And, uh, and so we're going to, from the bench, um, create something that we can't necessarily point to and say that was the intent, but we know what the outcome is, and the outcome certainly was in with, within the confides and, the, again, the, 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 the direction of the Constitution, that one where individuals are treated equally uh, or there's equity uh, in the law, if not the outcome of the law, uh, of its impact. And then something called strict constructionism, which is really, a, or textualism, where you're, really, you're reading into the, the letter of the law and, 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 and going by each word as written and, and acknowledging that those things that aren't written aren't to be included, right? If it's there, it's there. If it's not there, we can't include it. I think kind of an interesting one might be this idea of free speech. If I was a strict constructionist um, um, to, to the, 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 the amendment to the Constitution that, that says that your speech shall not be abridged, well, this is speech, right? The things I write, right? That's the press, right? That's the press. And, and whether I write them or some institution writes them, we can get into that question as well, right? So is the press whatever anybody writes? Or what the right that 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 entity that produces media, the the newspapers, the television, that that's the press, and specifically the press to be protected under the First Amendment. So so are we talking about the press in terms of pamphleteers from the private individuals or organizations, or are we talking about anything that I would simply write? So we can we can talk about the press here in a second. But when it comes to free speech, this is speech, right? This is I'm speaking. And so in, in my process of speaking, right, that's protected. So I can stand up against my government, can talk about my government, can, can talk about how we need to lock up the governor. I have freedom of speech. I can say that without fear of reprisal from my government. That's the First Amendment. Now, once we take speech, which is this conveyance of ideas, to action, right, where we're burning things or we're detaining individuals, or we're, now there's the, is that speech or is that not speech? And that's been a question before the court. Now, a strict constructionist would say, look, it doesn't say anything about burning stuff in the Constitution as a protection. It doesn't say anything in there in the Constitution about, now, the fact that it's not in the Constitution, 10th Amendment, should be left to the states to decide, but for you to actually find an enumerated right to burn stuff in the Constitution, it's not there. Now, this is where the Ninth and Tenth Amendments come in. Again, if I'm an originalist, 
or even a strict constructionist. I look to the Constitution and say, hey, if it doesn't say it, if it doesn't say I can't do it, even if it doesn't say I can do it, then it falls to me, all right, or to the state or to common law, but it falls to me, right? Not, and this is where, I, I, not to de, uh, deviate too far, but this is kind of the genius of the United States in comparison to um, other countries, right? More countries that have been, uh, that predated the United States, but still have kind of this, <laughs> the Western, right? They still have this, this mentality that the state rules all. And, and so, as I've been told, um, I haven't witnessed this, but as I've been told, as I've read, the, uh, when, it, when it comes to Europe, the, the culture, right, the socialization, the learning of beliefs and understanding of their government is one where <laughs> there's, there's trepidation, if not fear, in, in, in doing something unless you know for sure that it's okay to do it. In other words, unless I have it in writing that it's okay for me to do X, I'm not going to do X. And in the United States, as I'm told, the socialization is, right, the understanding is, is that if there's, if there's nothing, if the, if the law is mum on it, if, it's, if, the law, if the law doesn't have any guidance for it, then it's left for me to decide. And I'm going to do it unless I, thus the government has somehow specifically said I can't do it and by the way, if they've said I can't do it, it better be in the Constitution someplace that empowers the government to say I can't do it. And I'm going to move forward on whatever it is I want to do until I'm told I can't, until I see the law that says I can't. Now, again, this idea of ignorance of the law is no excuse. Don't go out and, and, uh, and go 110 miles between speed zones because you didn't see the speed sign that said I can't go 110 miles an hour even though it had a 70 and a 70 at the you know, book ending your speeds. But what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is, um, yes, there are laws in place, but when it comes to that entrepreneurial spirit, we approach our relationship to government as one where it's, it's limited and it's limited to those things that we allow it to do. And if we haven't allowed it to do that, then it's up to us, right, to, to, to push forward. And then it's up to them to tell us why we can't. And then, it's up to the courts, if we challenge it, to tell either the individual or the government who's right in this relationship as to what power an individual has um, um, in this relationship. So, again, strict constructionism, restraint, um, strict constructionists hang on every word. Um, the interpretation of the Constitution, we go to originalism. Uh, again, how do we interpret this relationship between uh, government and the individual? What was the intent of the framers as they wrote this constitution? Is it one of individual freedom uh, at where a government protects those individual freedoms? Or is it one of the protecting the collective and the community, one that ensures equity amongst individuals? What is the intent or what was the intent of the constitution? And I, th I think you can find arguments for both you know, within the Declaration of Independence, all men being created equal, right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. I mean, those are um, uh, those values we talk about that anchor um, our ideological spectrum. Um, and, and I think we could see in the intent of the original Constitution as one that was uh, uh, seeking to empower the national government uh, to really dictate um, m m many things down to the states. And then a rejection of that open-ended, um, those open-ended dictates to something that said, okay, what is enumerated or written in the Constitution, that's the power you have. Anything outside of that will be left to the states. And how justices interpret, right, those guiding documents lend themselves to the idea of activism, originalism, restraint, and strict constructionism. Stereo to see sees along past decisions to stand what we might call a following precedent. Okay, so... Some concepts there for you. Let's look in terms of structure, right? We've we've done the schematic for our legislative branch, right? The bicameral legislative branch, the two chambers, right? And so a problem comes in and gets formulated throughout, right? So build is the problem coming in. Build problem comes in. It's formulated between those two chambers, right? And what comes out, right? Of these two chambers, the same thing that comes out, that's when we get to adoption. 
right? So we've adopted a solution. The job of the legislature then, the ball is passed on to the executive. And then it's top down management, right? From the executive to the proper division of government. There's a lot of divisions of government now, but the proper division of government. And then through that division of government, right? There's lesser divisions, smaller divisions, all the way down to that street level bureaucrat, the public administrator, as, as the term du jour allows, this individual that you and I are most likely to come in contact with. And then they, you and I coming in contact with this entity, let's just say it's the police enforcing the law and you and I, right? Whatever it is that we were doing, okay? We might find ourselves a foul to the law and this then goes back to where the courts come in to, to ensure that this relationship between the individual and the government is correct, right? So when you've been accused of breaking the law, you have the right, the right, the protection, the right, the constitutional right to have the courts, including a, a group of your peers, a jury, take a look at this law, in my opinion, which is correct on this one, to put not only the law on trial, but to put the individual who quote unquote broke the law on trial, right? You and I are the individuals who are in charge of our community. Um, and the idea of putting um, um, the person alleged to have broken a crime before a jury of their peers is so that the peers, the individuals in the community can determine whether or not what this individual has done is so bad, it warrants this individual being punished, right? There's no other reason other than that to have your peers at play here. People like you within the community who live by the same laws you do, who then have the ability to say, this, this doesn't make sense or this makes sense. Now, juries that go off the rails, there's checks and balances to that as well. There's appeals process and, and the courts have the ability to, to alter the, 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 the determinations of juries. But, but again, it's still one where the jury is really taking a look at the whole situation, the law, its application, its impact upon their community. They're the ones who've got to live in the community, right? We are the ones who have to live in the community. And so when we apply laws or laws are put in place, um, how do we want to treat those laws? I think about marijuana laws, for example, of course, in Michigan now, the voters have, have uh, passed law that uh, um, has legalized marijuana. It's not legal at the federal level, right? But who's going to enforce those laws or the feds going to enforce those laws if they do? Where does the individual go to be tried? Well, according to the Constitution, a person, as we get into the amendments, has the right to be tried within the district that the crime happens. So they're going to be tried within the state of Michigan. And so if you ask a jury, right, a jury of peers in the state of Michigan in a district where this federal crime took place of marijuana use or whatever the case may be, and you ask them, is this individual guilty of the federal crime? Well, the answer to that is the federal government says you can't do it. The individual did it. I'm going to apply the law to the crime, you know, and I'm going to say that the individual broke the law then. But if we go with, again, what I think is the proper interpretation of a jury of peers who live in the community and you ask them and they look at the state law and they look at their local community and they apply this, 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 this law to their local community, local community standards, they may come back and say, we're not prosecuting this individual and we don't agree with this federal law or we're not going to, and, and, you know, pound for pound, I think that's a better, a more proper way to, to apply law where the power, the political power rests in the hands of the citizens. All right. Otherwise, just have the judges decide. They're the ones who are learned in the law. Why even have a jury? The, the, the judge goes to school to learn the law. The judge is the end of it. Just have them decide what's okay or not okay, All right? Juries don't make sense then if we, we can't put the law itself from time to time, all the time ultimately, on trial as well. So here we have a situation, again, where the government is coming in contact with the individual. What's the schematic? Well, this schematic, a little different. We're making a triangle, right? So we got our two boxes, we got our long rectangle. We'll make this one trial. In fact, we'll make it a pyramid. And at the base of the pyramid, right? This is where your trial courts are, right? So there's a lot of trial courts. And 
where we've been kind of focused on the federal government and then recognizing that your state government is structured the same way as state legislature. You have a state house, a state Senate, you have a state right, a governor and a state um, um, a bureaucracy. You also have state courts. The far majority of court cases, right? The far majority of laws and infractions that may be broken by the individual will happen in the state courts in terms of evaluation. So here we are at evaluation. And you're afforded evaluation simply by being told you've broken the law. Uh, this is where due process comes in, something we'll talk about later. But this is the, the schematic or the structure. And so this level here, this lowest level, this is what we call the trial courts. And I like to call these what we call municipal courts, or, or I like to call them dangler courts. You also have kind of little expedited courts that exist as part of the trial court to help ex expedite the process um, of, of evaluation. Uh, courts that don't require juries, if you forego the jury, uh, like traffic court, for example, or bankruptcy court, or um, um, juvenile court. And a lot of these different named courts, right? These get very specific to an area of law, help to expedite, to adjudicate some kind of a, hopefully balance between the state and the uh, individual, the state and the individual in terms of how the law is being applied and something, again, that the court find equity in. And oftentimes these municipal courts, <clears throat> excuse me, that's where that's where the magistrate, that's, that's what the magistrate is looking to do, kind of create that balance and, and equilibrium. Um, you know, I, I'm, you know, knock on wood, I haven't, uh, I haven't received a lot of speeding tickets or traffic tickets or things like that throughout my life. But I, I you know, like, like all of us may have rolled through a stop sign and, and uh, not paying real good attention or so used to the roads, know that there's no traffic usually coming in, regardless of what the issue is. Um, I, I've received traffic tickets before, speeding tickets, civil infractions. And, and um, you got to weigh out the cost and your time and the, and the effort. But generally speaking, usually I'll, I'll take it to the magistrate. All right. Not because I think that uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, get out of the ticket altogether, though that's a possibility, right? Oftentimes if the, um, uh, the, the officer who issued the ticket doesn't show up, uh, the magistrate will find a default in your favor. And so that's always a possibility. Again, if it's an issue of time and the issue of money, it's something to consider. But, but really, um, even if the officer does show up, um, if you can explain and express why uh, you might have um, um, gotten the ticket, and if there's some kind of an argument or explanation that, that fits within, you know, this is, this is, these things happen kind of a, uh, an explanation. Again, it's going to depend on the magistrate, but generally speaking, the magistrate will try to reach some balance, right? Like you got to pay the fine, but we'll avoid the points kind of a thing, right? You know, who, Points go to really ultimately the insurance company. The insurance company jacks your price up, right? You know that's that's usually how the points come in. But the fine, the dollars, go back to the community, back to the state, back to enforcement. And so, you know, so as a magistrate goes, right, cares probably a lot less about the insurance company and the insurance company, right, impacting you or negatively impacting a member of the community. But those dollars that go back to the community, right? So, so. Oftentimes, the magistrate looking for some balance between the individual and the state will we'll, we'll, we'll cut a bit of a deal. Not all the time, and I wouldn't expect it, but if you simply pay the fine and accept the responsibility, you get the points, you get the fine, you move forward, right? So it's something, again, in Michigan you might, might think about if you find yourself on the, uh, on the end of, a, of a getting a ticket. Um, then, like I said, bankruptcy court or juvenile court, small claims court. Um, I've been to small claims court as well. We have a family business, and from time to time, the the contract, right? Like we think about the contract between the states and the national government, the contract between the individual and uh, and and the services provided uh, by our company, they don't match up. And so, if uh, individuals don't believe that we've provided the service that we have provided, or we believe we've provided, a good way to go. To, to, to get reconciliation is is in small claims court. It's adversarial. It's not good. Um, you know, typically speaking, you don't continue to do business with somebody. You have to take the small claims court either way. So it's good to avoid it. But at the same time, it may be necessary. 
um, when there's a, a true disagreement or a, or a true understanding um, or belief that, that you're in the right and the other party's in the wrong. Uh, but they're all, again, expedited courts. There was no jury involved, right? The magistrate makes the decision. Now, here's the thing. With all trial courts, municipal courts included, you can appeal the decision, right? We have a process of appeal. In the appellate process, the next level of court, there's fewer courts, but the appeals process, the appellate process, the court of appeals, right? This is actually going to be a group of judges, not just one judge with jury or one judge kind of sitting in and, 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 and trying to find that balance, create a ruling, but it'll be a judge or a group of judges, um, maybe three, right, at the appellate level who will hear a case and what they're looking to is they're looking to the reason you appealed, right? So if you appeal, you've got to appeal on some grounds. There's some reason that the trial court, the lower court found for either you, well, winners don't appeal, right? There's no reason to appeal. Losers appeal. So, so if, the, if the court found in favor of the individual, the state could appeal if it chose to, right? Um, sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. More often than not, if the state wins, right, the court comes down on the side of the state and you disagree with that, then you're the individual who will ultimately appeal, right? Losers appeal, right? Winners don't appeal. There's no reason to appeal, right? Like the Lions won a game on Sunday, right? I wouldn't expect the Lions to go back to the refs who are apt to do it to go, hey, we really don't think we won. Uh, could you please take this game away or take off that last touchdown? Um, you, you don't, you don't appeal those things like that, right? The other side might say, hey, he was out of bounds, right? Or this, this you know, this, uh, the time ran out before uh, the ball was hiked or something to that effect. Um, uh, but winners don't appeal. So the loser appeals. And then the appellate court, right, at this level, they're going to hear the case, right? They're going to take a look at it. And then they'll create, they'll come up with some judgment. Um, but what they're looking for is they're looking for you to tell them why the this court made the wrong decision. Why, why did this court make the wrong decision for you to need to appeal to the next level? And, uh, um, and then whatever the answer to that is, that's, that's what the appellate court is really judging on. And the appellate court can make one of three decisions. They can affirm the lower court's decision. In other words, lower court got it right. You, you or your appeal doesn't work, right? The lower court got it right. We're going to affirm the lower court's decision. They can reverse the lower court's decision, right? They can say, you know what, lower court, you got it wrong, right? This is the proper, uh, this would have been the proper outcome. So we're going to reverse your decision. Or as often happens, the appellate court may remand it back down for reconsideration. Say, look, uh, you did make an error. But we're not ready to throw this whole case out or to change the outcome of this case. We just want you to retry it or reconsider it, or reconsider it with this information in mind. In other words, if the individual appeals because um, there was tainted information or you, you know, there was some evidence that wasn't allowed in, it should have been allowed in, you can make that appeal. And then this appellate court may say, yeah, you should have allowed that evidence in. It's not enough for us to reverse the decision, but we're going to send it back down and you're going to retry it and you're going to allow this evidence in, or you're going to con consider your, your, your interpretation of who was right and who's wrong with this evidence allowed, something to that effect. So you're remanding it back down for reconsideration. Now, here's the thing, right? So we got one, two. There's another court on top of this appeals court. So again, the appeals court makes the decision. We're going to reaffirm the lower court's decision. So you still lose. You get another shot at it. You can say, well, I don't think you're right, appeals court, and I'm going to take it to the next level. That next level is your Supreme Court. Now, at the federal level, federal federal level of courts, I said most of this happens at the state level. At your federal level, that would be the U.S. Supreme Court, okay? At your state level, it's the state Supreme Court. Now, you might pop yourself out of the state court into the federal court, and your argument would be or should be or could be that right? You, you have a right to a fair trial. That's a federal protected right. And through what's called selective incorporation, the incorporation of the Bill of Rights into each state government's, um, um, you know, uh, 
book of have tos. You have to follow the, the, these amendments to the Constitution, these protections. A person, thank, thankfully, you know, thanks to the 14th Amendment, which we touched on, but the idea that the Constitution, those concepts of the Constitution extend to all the states as well. And so the idea of a fair trial, if it's not in the state's constitutional uh, protections of the individual, which it is in our state, the right? state of Michigan has the right to a fair trial written in the state constitution. But regardless, the, the, the right to a fair uh, uh, trial is a, is, a, is a constitutional national right. And so you might argue that something here is just, I'm not getting a fair trial altogether and I need the federal government to take a look at this. So we're gonna pop out of the state government and go to the federal government. That happens, it can happen, uh, but more often than not, it follows this natural course. Now, again, if the state Supreme Court makes a decision that, that goes against you, you, you do have the ability to pop that out and go into the federal courts or go to the U.S. Supreme Court, or go to the federal courts for them to take a look at this. All right. So we're not done just at the state Supreme Court. Usually we are. But we but the fact is, is that there is the potential for it to go even beyond the state Supreme Court. Now, does the state Supreme Court have to hear a case? It doesn't. Generally speaking, the state will uh, hear the case. Certainly the federal U.S. Supreme Court does not have to hear any cases. Um, the cases they choose to hear, I mean, there's something called original jurisdiction where in the Constitution these cases are to go before the court. Um, but when it comes to cases working their way up to, this, to the U.S. Supreme Court, they can, the U.S. Supreme Court can say, we're not going to hear this case. In fact, most cases that get appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court won't be heard. Right? There's, there's about a million cases, million questions, right? 300 million or so people, about a million questions of law that happen in any given year. And from that million questions of law, about 90% are decided here. They're, they're, they're pled out, they're decided here. From there, as they move up, this 100,000 or so move up, you get to about 7,000 or so that are appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. And from that 7,000 cases that have worked their way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court will hear about 100 of them, 100, 110. Right? That's the typical load of the U.S. Supreme Court. So from this million questions of law, the U.S. Supreme Court may hear right, about 110 of them. All right? And then from the 7,000 that are actually appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, again, it's that same 100 of them. So you know, what, why not the other 6,900? Right? That's, that's the court. Uh, when the court decides to hear a case, we call that, we give it its Latin term. That's granting cert. Cert has been shortened. Certiorari. It's a mouthful. Certiorari. Certiorari. Granting cert. Certiorari. <laughs> And like I said, it's a mouthful. So we'll just, just call it granting cert. And if you want to think of it this way, this is granting the hearing, the granting the taking the look at, the granting of making more certain. Making more certain. All right? So cert and certain to make more certain. So, so. Right, you would think the lower courts made a, a bad decision, or even the state supreme courts made a bad decision. Appealing to the U.S. Supreme Court is attempting to make that decision more certain. Right, were their decisions correct? Or weren't they? Uh, so, granting cert is the approval of the U.S. Supreme Court to actually hear the case, to grant cert, and uh, and most cases will be denied cert. Right, most appeals will be denied cert. Um, so, where are we in time? This is a good time to end it. Uh, we'll, we'll start at kind of granting cert and moving into the, to the Supreme Court and then how the Supreme Court then deals with it once they've granted cert, right? So the hearing of an actual court case and then rendering an opinion uh, in this process. But here's the schematic, right? Legislature, bureaucracy, the courts, bottom up, right? From kind of the wide different trial courts, the appellate court to that one Supreme Court or the 50 state Supreme Courts, and then over to the U.S. Supreme Court. Of course, you've got the military courts as well, kind of its own separate entity. Um, 
you know, um, uh, but as citizens, as has been uh, decided as citizens, even if you're a citizen in the military, you're still a citizen. And the uh, U.S. Constitution does apply to you as well, even though there may be a subset of laws uh, that, that, that also govern actions and, and must be applied. Um, so anyhow, we'll stop it here. Uh, again, kind of a lot today. Um, that'll allow us to do, I think, a little bit of recap um, on Wednesday and allow you to get kind of started on that test if you want to during the class time uh, versus waiting sometime in the evening uh, to try to find the time. All right, you guys, as always, don't hesitate to email me if you have any questions. Uh, probably easier than trying to give me a call. Uh, I'm on campus on Mondays and Wednesdays. Um, if you want to stop in and see me, the best time to do that is uh, between uh, 10 and 1130. If there's something that you want to uh, discuss that, that takes a face-to-face -face with a mask, socially distanced, uh, a conversation, we can do that. If um, um, if it's not something that's pressing and needs face-to-face, -face, then the best thing you can do, again, is to, is to fire me an email. Um, the only time I'm really on campus is right now, and I'm only doing it because I, I like the whiteboard and uh, the computer's fast enough to keep up with um, what's being streamed out versus my one at home, for whatever reason, is very choppy. Okay, any emails? Don't hesitate to fire them out. I'll answer them as quickly as I can. We'll see you guys on Wednesday.